In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Saint Monica, troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired of lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you pray daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear Saint Monica, for... And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. you notice the gospel today was the one chosen for it's called a proper gospel it's of the mass of saint monica we have a choice of choosing daily readings or proper readings on a memorial like today but the but this gospel is too good to pass up in relation to saint monica there's just that one line where jesus comes and says do not weep and he stepped forward and touched the coffin and his the, the bearers halted and he said young man i tell you arise in that case, there, there is, he says not to weep. The occasions in Scripture, Jewish understanding, Catholic thought of crying, weeping, to weep or not to weep is so extensive. There are just a few reflections today. I've, been, I've only lived with my first time living in San Francisco, but I've been coming to the city because I have family here. I've been coming for years. And I always make this, I always used to make this pilgrimage of sorts up to uh, Christ Le Ray, the Carmelite Monastery. And now I celebrate Mass there and help out the sisters. But I, when I can, even yesterday, I had a doctor's appointment across the street. And so afterwards I went to St. Christ Le Ray is closed in the afternoons now. But St. Ignatius is still open. And I'm always drawn to the back. There's an old statue of St. Ignatius. And it's unique, though it's not, I mean, there are others in the world, but St. Ignatius is there in Vesta as a priest, of which, of course, he was. But as I got to know St. Ignatius, and in a way I've known the Jesuit saints longer than the Dominican because I'd gone to a Jesuit university. And so St. Ignatius always, always interests me, even though I wasn't called to his particular way of life. And he was known very much for his weeping. And perhaps it's in a way that we don't quite understand today. Uh, and, and But, but St. Ignatius, uh, this idea, this, this weeping of St. Ignatius is something that I think Pope Francis has, has certainly from his own Jesuit background uh, drawn out even into his own preaching. And he speaks about tears a lot, Pope Francis. He speaks about tears of compassion, of what's called compunction, of consolation, different sorts of tears. And you know, Pope Francis wants an, a, 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 an emotional response, a real response, to the power of Christ in our lives. And he had actually mentioned, which surprised me in a sense, one prayer from the old Mass. And he said how, how there was a prayer that, that began something like, Lord, who commanded Moses to strike the rock so that water might gush forth, strike the stone of my heart so that, I, that there are tears that flow forth from my, from my soul. And I've seen that. It is indeed in the Old Missal. And there's actually a prayer, a whole Mass for the gift of tears, for the gift of, of weeping. So Pope Francis had said that, you know, tears prepare us, prepare our eyes to see the Lord, which is an amazing kind of thing to say. And tears can sometimes water the garden of our faith because tears aren't, a lo- aren't necessarily, and aren't usually, in fact, a point of, a, a a sign of despair, but rather than a, a, a seeking in us for something, something else. So St. Ignatius was known for his own weeping. It's, it's interesting to consider. There he is in his priestly vestments, but when I look at him, I remember the fact that he did not celebrate Mass for quite a while after he was ordained. And it's that ancient concept that he wasn't worthy. And, I, you know, for us, when we were ordained, we ran to it. The first thing we did, of course, was to celebrate Mass uh, when we were ordained priests. But yet there's something to reflect on there, that power of God and how we are unworthy, but the Lord is worthy. 
And he works through us so we are humble instruments. So this, though, though, you, though strange to us maybe, this idea, that part of St. Ignatius' story needs to be understood and preserved. St. Ignatius, after his conversion especially, could not stop weeping. Why? Why? Sometimes we're told, I think, to move past our sins and get over it. I know a lot of people in confessional come to me, oh, I know the priest last time told me, don't confess this, get over it. Well, there's, sometimes it's okay, you know, because there's this ongoing uh, work of healing that needs to be done. And we have to acknowledge that and embrace that. So sometimes there's tears. There's tears of sorrow sometimes. Well, how did I get in this spot? Or something's going bad in my life. But sometimes there's this tears of conversion, this com- what's called compunction. And compunction can be its own topic. But St. Ignatius then, why is he weeping? Because he's sad? Because he's unworthy? Not exactly. Paul alludes to these kind of tears in his own writing. Compunction is, are those tears of, of almost joy. There's a sorrow for sin, but there's a joy in the Lord. There's a humility before him. It, it might have been tears if he was shedding them of the, when the publican and the Pharisee in the temple. The Pharisee so proud, but the publican didn't look up. This is a kind of compunction in his heart. Whether they're tears or not, I don't know. But it's that humility before the Lord that recognize, not that I've done so well and I deserve to be here, but rather, you are good. And you have called me in your mercy to be here. And I don't understand why, but I rejoice. In, my, in the presence here. There's that wonderful line in the uh, second Eucharistic prayer, the short one, that talks about our, our, the Lord calling us and making us worthy to stand before him. Again, not because of us, but because of him. And so St. Teresa of Avila, St. Ignatius, the, the saints of that period had recommended a tears and, that, and had found in their own lives that mysterious consolation of, of tears in their life. And when Pope Francis encounters people in their difficulties or lives and, and have, been, have told him his story and either weeping themselves or brought him to tears, he remarks on that and how this is a sign that there's a process of healing, a sign of grace that's beginning, like the water from the cross or the water from the eyes then restore us exterior and interior. It's the beginning, though it's hard, it's, it's painful, it brings us forward. And so, St. Ignatius, when he writes his his, his uh, spiritual exercises, he asks then for himself and for others that grace to weep abundantly either over one's own sins or over the pains and sorrows endured by the cross of Christ. And so when we hear that, no, it's not just because we're sad, because we don't trust in God's mercy, but when we talk about these kinds of tears in the church, tears of compunction, we mean tears precisely because of God's mercy. The fathers, the ancient desert fathers, had talked about those tears, those warm tears that come as the second baptism. There is another kind of tear, though, as we well know. There's the tears of sorrow. And we see, or, or, or of, of pity. The, the Lord, it, it, he doesn't weep in the story in the gospel today, but she does. But the Lord has compassion. And he is moved by our tears. Pope St. John Paul II had said something so wonderful. He said it a few times in different ways. He said, whenever there's sorrow, hurt, difficulty, darkness, the Lord is crucified for this and he is present there. He is present. And just like in his life when there are tears, he is present. And although we may discern it, we may not always feel it, he is present. He, he is moved by tears, especially when we reach out to him. Especially when we're at, we're at wit's end. And we're weeping and we don't know what to do, but we turn to him the beginning of grace. They're the beginning then of, of, of opening our heart to Christ. So the sorrow of the faithful, indeed the sorrow of all people, moves the Lord. We, we, we find a great representative for this. When people are really in despair, when we're really sad, when we're really sorrowful, it's okay. Because we go to who? But our, the, our Lady of Sorrows at the foot of the cross. And we talked about all kinds of theology around crying and, and weeping and tears, a prayer, faith, hope, etc. There's a point even in the Blessed Mother, there's this sadness, there's sorrow. We, call, we, don't, we don't use this word lightly. She is, she is, she, her heart is broken. The image used in the Gospel is a sword that pierces her heart. And this makes sense to us, anybody who is a, a mother or a father, but on a deeper level too of grace is that first disciple of Christ, 
then there is this, there's this sorrow. This is what the apostles do. We have to be compassionate with the apostles. We're not. You know, when they all run away, there's a sorrow. And Thomas is, has a sorrow. He's not ready to touch Christ. I, I'm not ready for this. But do you remember that, huh? So this, this sorrow then is very real. And yet, it's also this, that the Lord is moved by tears, these kinds of, this kind of sorrow. She unites it. She's the first then to unite her sufferings to the cross. She is with her son, you see. It's natural for her. Of course she's uniting it. She's not just united to Jesus, her son, but to Christ, her Savior. So she opens the door for us to understand this sort of sorrow in a real way. And we must have, under, be patient with ourselves in our sorrow and see others in sorrow and pray for them or be with them in that, in, in that moment then where we can bring them into that mystery of the cross by our presence. If you didn't read it, Father Michael had a wonderful story in the bulletin this past week and about then tears and the person that he encounters in the church and being with them in that moment of sorrow. To do what Paul does. To rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. St. Ambrose, or the, the teacher of St. Augustine, who St. Monica went to, in particular saw Mary as that powerful figure at the cross who stood furiously, yes, but also looks into her son's wounds for the salvation of the world. And as she sees it, if you will, just like Pope Francis says, through the lens of the water of her te- the tears. So as our, our Lord is moved with pity also, or with, with Our Lady's sorrow, so it is with this mother we hear about in the Gospel from today that, that we had read. There's, there's this weeping, and the Lord says not to weep, but he's moved, he's moved to pity for her. And there's so many times in the Gospels where the Lord is moved to compassion or pity. It's a wonderful thing. We know what compassion means. Their compassion, what does that mean? It means, it means not just opening of a heart. It does mean that in that modern context, but also means a suffering with. So when Our Lady, Our Lady it used to be said, had a compassionate heart for her son, is that she endures the passion with him. So it also she is compassionate for us, endures our suffering with us. And so it is with the Lord in the same way. He is compassionate. He is moved to, to pity. And he brings then joy in, of course, the raising of the dead of of this young man. St. Augustine himself comments on this gospel, which is interesting. And he says, Our mother of the church rejoices every day when people are raised again in spirit. The young man had been dead physically, the latter dead spiritually. So the mother being dead spiritually. The young man's death was mourned visibly, the death of the latter was invisible and unmourned. He seeks them out who knew them to be dead. Only he can bring them back to life. So not only life in the body, but life in the soul. And again, this is often then where, where we remember then uh, the, the real sorrow, the real reason for tears. And this is what moved, of course, St. Monica to her tears. St. Augustine is becoming successful. He's doing all the right things but not in the interior life. And this is the point where she wept. And so we remember her tears. And, and after she had that place where she had kicked out Augustine and had that vision, since she went to a bishop, which some say is Ambrose, she did know Ambrose, St. Ambrose. Whether or not it was this St. Ambrose himself that said this, sometimes it's unclear in the stories, or contradictory, to be honest. But a bishop consoles, consoles her and says, the child of those tears will never perish or such a translation. And so this story um, is so beautiful for us and gives us hope to know that our prayers, our sacrifices, our tears are efficacious. These are nothing before God. And yet God loves us in the efforts we make. He cares for us in our littleness, which is so wonderful. There's another person, a divine person, that we can't ignore the tears of. Our Lord has moved the compassion and pity many times. But three times we know that he wept. And, and just briefly, what are those times? Because they're important, I think. The Lord weeps for the suffering of those who he loves. Of Martha, of Mary, and of the deaths of Lazarus. In fact, they, the people see him weeping and they say, look how much he loved them. 
They're moved too by the weeping of the Lord, who does not often weep, at least they're not recorded in Scripture. But he weeps because he loves them. He cares for us. He cares for us that we might have eternal life. He cares for us in our needs. He desires our happiness. And yet, also in his humanity, we can't overlook. He doesn't do everything. Don't think that the Lord, you know, he's not doing things to fulfill prophecies only or just to be, just to, to display that he's God, is he? No, he's also moved in his humanity. He weeps. So sometimes, you know, and I mentioned on Sunday, Sunday we were told to just rejoice the funeral. The Lord didn't. He wept. He wept, and it's okay. We need that space. If we're going to come to the point of a resurrection and of hope, it's okay to have those tears. The Lord wept too, because He loved them so much. The shortest line in Scripture, you might know, is Jesus wept, period. And it's when He comes over the city, and there's a beautiful chapel, and I hope to be there in a couple of weeks, actually, myself. There's a beautiful chapel shaped like a pier, and it's about this size of this lady's chapel here. And it's, it's, that represents the place where the early Christians knew that Jesus had stopped, looked over the city, and you can see the city from here. It's a unique angle. And he wept for the sins that they had done, for the killing of the prophets, and for the sins that we had commit, that indifference to God that would rob them of eternal life. And he weeps and breaks his heart. We have to remember, you know, as I was talking about judgment yesterday, and some people would even accuse the Lord in a sense of judgment. Why, why does he want to impose himself on me? And you get this concept sometimes. Or why would even the church are trying to do the best to articulate his teachings? Why would they impose this on me? And yet, why does he weep? We can't lose sight of that. Because he wants us to be alive in his grace. He wants us to know his mercy, to know the freedom that belongs to the sons and daughters of God. Lastly, he sheds tears, of course, when he weeps in the garden. Not just tears, but blood and tears. And, and today we know the medical reason even for that, that that can happen. And, and same with the water and blood that come forth from the side. Not only a theological significance here, but, but we understand this also in a medical way today, which, is, which shows the great distress of the Lord. The great sorrow of God. And, the, and the, in his humanity, a legitimate fear of what's going to happen. He asked the Father, take this away from me. But no, no, your will be done. Saint, um, um, the letter of the letter of Hebrews even mentions this in the garden. And we often forget that. He says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard for his godly fear. Well, interesting, because we know the Father and the Son are consubstantial. And yet the, the Lord prays as if we would, and the Father hears him. So there's a theological exchange, you know, like underneath from the water, and there's the human, human, human exchange, the tumultuous part, like on that river, you know? And there it is, that prayer. So this is, this is recorded for us so we might also see the compassion of the Lord for us, but also identify very much with his suffering. And, and you know, there's some cultures, uh, especially uh, some of the, the um, Hispanic cultures, uh, certainly Filipino cultures, that there's an identity uh, of some with the sorrowful Christ. Because he's like us. He's like us in this way. And he shows us that path to hope. So he wants then these prayers, we understand that there's a place for fear and sorrow and tears, and it's okay. But again, what do we do? But to cast ourselves on the Lord, that the angel of the Lord, just like Christ, might minister to us and strengthen us. Sunday, Monday, I mentioned the tears of St. Dominic. And, and ma actually, many places in the Nine Ways of Prayer and the biographies of Blessed Jordan, uh, and, and also the writings of... Uh, there's another place that, 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 in fact, the tears of Dominic are mentioned. And he weeps. One of the things he's a little different than St. Ignatius, several centuries before, he says, do not weep for yourselves. He, he, his school of thought, there are schools, schools exchange, you know, even now, you know, sometimes you have these Dominican Jesuit jokes, but Dominican Jesuits, Carmelites, Franciscans, the Byzantines, etc., we can learn from the different ways of living out the gospel. So they're not put these in tension, but we learn from them, huh? So St. Dominic, even though he's before, he comes almost like a dialogue partner with St. Ignatius. And he says, no, we shouldn't weep for our sins so much. He wasn't so much about compunction. He says, we've got to get past that. 
So in Dominic, he moved past that a little bit. But he also had an innocent way of life, too. It was known in his confession that he was really very much a saint his whole life. His final confession. So, he says, let's not focus on ourselves, but see and look with the eyes of Christ out in the world. And this is part you see the genius of the Dominican order. Why, in fact, the order was founded. And it's not a selfish thing. It's a good thing when you have Benedict and Cistercians, the rest founded. Why? Salvation of souls. They do have an idea to pray for the world, yes. But it's a salvation of often their own soul. That they're seeking their salvation. And don't think like the Dominicans say, we're not seeking our salvation in the order too. We are. But the order itself is founded for the salvation of others. And so not just preaching, going out and working, teaching, etc. But it, does, it begins in the heart. It begins then in that sanctuary of compassion I talked about, the prayer. This is why even here it's the prior, the new prior, I've emphasized the prayer, that we pray for the needs of the church. You know, Father Michael take care of the needs, and he prays for, he has to emphasize this as well, but me especially as the director of St. Jude Shrine, all these prayers are coming in that we must pray for them as we promised. We must pray for them and bring them in our heart. St. Dominic, though, in his prayer was also known for his weeping. His compassion, this is from Blessed Jordan, his compassion for sinners would often result in him spending nights before the cross, weeping and crying out to the Lord to have mercy on sinners. And he was often heard beseeching the Lord, what will become of sinners? People are starving for the truth. And this is a line today, a commentary. People are striving for the, starving for the, church, the truth, and he was determined they should hear it, and that he desired that they be converted through love, not coerced by force. So, weeping then, having that compassion, trying then, then to water even the hearts of those who, who struggle or those who do not believe. So in the life of St. Dominic as well, we, we see that this weeping, but it's all very much connected to the weeping of Christ himself. That weeping then, that, that the tears, not for those who are lost, but that they might be found. That they might be strengthened in the mercy and power of God. And so, in this Triduum of St. Monica, we, we see then this woman, not just a woman who wept because her son didn't do what she wanted, but wept because more than being her son, she knew that he was created in the image of God and he was called to be a disciple of the Lord. We shouldn't be afraid of making that judgment of Christ, the good judgment, the good and holy judgment, that says, all people are created in the image of God. And all people can know Him. And there should be a sadness in us, a sorrow, when, when uh, we know in our own lives, or the lives of our family, or even the world, people of the world, that they do not know that freedom of Christ. And who will, who will take it to them? Our road is the spiritual and corporal works of mercy that we might display forth then, from our own efforts, uh, the love of Christ. But we shouldn't be afraid or think it's not efficacious to pray for those in need. Especially if the mon uh, model of St. Monica, pray for those in our charge, under our care, or those that are closest to us. To pray and even to weep that they might find the Lord. In this scripture reading today, we know that above all, it's another example, that the Lord has visited his people. And he visited St. Monica and her family and he visits us. He is with us and is moved by our prayers and our tears for, for, uh, out, of, out of compassion for us that we might have eternal life. So let us then conclude with our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, women, me. Mercy. Are you of the particular? <coughs> According to you, to bring visible and speedy help where they're most despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly
and that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage you. St. Jude, pray for us. Paul's honor and